Welcome everybody to WDS's newest game in the Panzer game series, Philippines 44. This is a tried and tested game system that was originally developed by the late John Tiller. This newest game and all the games in his series have been enhanced, modified, and beautified by War Games Design Studio, aka WDS so that today they are as fresh now as when they were first introduced some years ago. Philippines 44 was designed by Bill Peters and assisted by others you can find in the credits section of the user manual. What I'm about to take you on now is a five minute tour of this game and all that it offers. So sit back and relax as we journey through this historical simulation. A Pacific Theater of Operations that stretches from October 1944 to the latter part of June 1945. A campaign with a terrible cost in blood. Americans themselves lost 70,000 killed or wounded and an even more staggering 420,000 Japanese casualties throughout the campaign. The first thing I want to tell you is that Philippines 44 is, without a doubt, the most historically researched game on the subject. You don't just move pieces on a board, roll dice, and capture flags. You are recreating history with the use of many tools, including painstakingly created maps, orders of battles, and many, many units of all kinds. And as you play this game, don't always expect the same historical results. Your aim is to do better, defeat your opponent faster and with fewer casualties. And if you fail the first time, or even the first 20 times, keep at it, as you will not only learn where the battles were fought and by whom, you have the chance to improve or even completely change history. Now that's pretty cool, eh? So now that the introductions are out of the way, let me show you the game. After the introduction screen appears, as shown here, you are invited to select a scenario. So let's have a look. As this will be your first game playing Philippines 44, I highly recommend that you start out with the getting started scenario. So if you were to choose the first scenario on the screen here and you select OK, you want to follow along with the PDF called getting started. So let me show you how to get there. First of all, when you see this screen on the selection dialog, you're going to hit OK. And then you're going to go to where it says Help. Well, actually, you're going to hit Ally Turn. Then you're going to hit Help. And then you're going to scroll on down to you see where it says Getting Started. After selecting that, the PDF will populate. And you'll have the opportunity to start playing the game. Now, for our purposes, we want to use a larger map so that we can see more of the playing area. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to go over to where it says File. I'm going to hit Selection. And we're going to take the second scenario, which is Leyte Operation Scenario. Now, as you click on it here, you'll get some details about the scenario. And the first thing that you'll notice is that it has 637 turns. Well, not to worry, we're not going to play 637 turns. That I can guarantee you. You'll also see the designer, as we previously mentioned, Bill Peters. And you'll see information about the scenario. I encourage you to read this thoroughly because there's important information in this description. Number one, you'll see here that this game is designed for head-to-head -head play. Now, that means that you're playing against somebody else, a human player, not the artificial intelligence. Now, you can, if you want to, play against yourself, in which case you would want to choose two-player hot seat because two-player hot seat hides the other player when you're playing the phasing player. That way you're kind of hiding the game against yourself. Now let's go ahead and say OK. And we're not going to save the previous game. We're going to go ahead and use manual for both sides because that will give us an opportunity to play both sides. So let's hit OK. Now it'll take just a second here to load up the upcoming scenario. Plus it's a bigger scenario so it'll take a moment to load. And there we go. It's all loaded up ready for the allied first turn. So after reading a brief report, we're going to hit OK. Keep in mind this is turn 1 of 637, but hey, we're not going to play that. But we're going to hit OK anyway. So here we go. We're going to hit OK. Now as we continue with this introduction, 
just listen to some background noises here by going to settings, hitting the drop down, we're going to find sound, and we're going to choose background sound. Now as we listen to this background sound here, just for a little bit here, but we'll be turning it off for a short here. But I wanted to break down this tour into five components. So the first thing that we're going to do is look at the toolbar. Then we're going to look at the maps both in 2D and in 3D. Then we're going to review some of the units, but remember now this game has a lot of different units, so we're not going to be able to review them all. Just a quick little tour. After that, we're going to take a look at the information box, which pretty much tells you everything that's in a particular hex. And then we're going to introduce you to the victory dialogue, which shows whether or not you are winning or losing the game. Also, let me tell you now, earlier I told you that this was going to be a five minute tour of the game. Well, keep in mind that we're just now starting the tour, so five minutes starts now. Now, from this point here, you might think that, well, this is a pretty complicated game here, and how am I ever going to figure it out? It will take a couple of turns here, and I'm, I'm not going to kid you on that there, but I can guarantee you that if you play the Getting Started scenario, and get a couple of games under your belt, you'll find that this game is actually pretty simple here, and follows along pretty logically. You'll enjoy every minute of it, I promise. Alright, so, now let's go ahead and get started. Now a really cool feature of this game here is that although there's a total number of 83 buttons on the toolbar, you can greatly navigate those tool buttons by simply choosing the category buttons at the top here. You'll notice that there are just seven of those, including the all. So if you eliminate the all, then you can knock them down into six different categories. Unit, Combat, Engineer, Report, Map, and Highlight. So let's take a look and see how that actually changes. If I select Unit, then you'll notice here that it greatly reduces the number of buttons that you need to select. Also the same thing with Combat. Those are combat related buttons here. For example, if you hover over these, you can see here where it says Resolve Assault. And also to the right of that, you'll see where it has the hotkey. So if you don't want to actually find a button, you can just control P and that will give you the same result as pushing the button. Resolve Assault. Next, we can choose Engineers and you can see that there's four Engineer buttons. If you hover over them, you can see there's Bridge Operations, Damaged Bridge, Lane Mines, and Clearing Mines. If you're the Americans in this game, you'll probably want to be clearing some mines. The next thing is Report. One of the most important things you'll see here is the victory dialogue. Now we're going to take a deeper dive into the victory dialogue shortly here, but I just wanted to show you what happens here when you push the button. So we can go ahead and unselect that, but also you see where there's arrived units. That's kind of where you pick up your reinforcements. You can look at your last command report. You can also look at the weather because this game has a lot of different features here and weather is an important factor here because you don't want to be trudging along in the mud for any longer than you have to. The next category is map. Now this is important here because this will break down different facets of the map. Like for example, if I start from left to right, I can actually see my units and I can put them into divisional colors. So you'll see here that the symbols change color based upon their uh, divisions. Then I can also select toggle units or I can just eliminate if I just want to see the map or the terrain underneath each unit. I'll still see that there's units there because that's what the white outline does. But I'll be able to see the terrain much easier with the units not there anymore. Well, let's go ahead and put them back. If I'm missing a unit, I can hit unit search. If I want to see where my supply sources are, because in any war, you march on your stomach, so you better know where your supply is, not to mention the fact that's where your ammunition comes from. And then, of course, your objectives. You'll notice that you see Japanese flags right now, right? Well, the Americans are going to have to come ashore and capture those flags. And if they don't want to see the flags, you can toggle them off so you can see the terrain easier. Or you can put them back on here. Also, there's con uh, specials on top, and then map elevations. You can select that if you want to know 
what the elevation is because as you march along here you'll notice here that you will lose movement points as you go through higher elevations just like if you were trudging along yourself there going through the jungle there and having to tramp up the higher elevations now look at this cool one here this is what we call map combat modifiers here now you can see if you look on here closely here you'll see where there's 20 percent 15 percent even 50 percent and then some zeros and five percent those are the combat modifiers for defending in those particular hexes so if you're a defender you want to stay where there's good combat modifiers here to give you the best chance for successfully defending that hex over here we have contours then you can see map by coordinate, hex maps, map coordinates, and then labels. Now this is a cool one here. If you select labels, you'll be able to see all the different places there on the map, including waterways, towns, cities, roads, and so on here. Everything that you ever wanted to know but were afraid to ask about what was where. Now if you want to get rid of all the toolbars and the info boxes and all that clutter there and you, all you want to do is see the map, you can hit the full screen. I'll just select it here so you can see what I'm talking about. Boom. There you go. You got rid of the info box. Actually the toolbar remains. My bad. Alright then. And then if you want to here you can zoom out or you can zoom in here. So. And that kind of leads us into our segue here of the different maps, both 2D and uh, 3D here. So let's let's start out with the going backwards here on the negative. So as you can see here, we are in a two-dimensional map or 2D, and this is the zoom normal. If I hit the negative here, we're going to zoom out. That means it's going to make the map smaller, so that you can see more of the map. Kind of gives you a more strategic view, so to speak. But if I go the other way here, and this is as far out as you can go, by the way. Uh, but if I go the other way here, I'm going to zoom in. So watch carefully now. So I'm going to go back to where you saw it before. Then I'm going to zoom in even closer so you can actually see some more definition here. Then I'm going to zoom in and it goes to three dimensional. So this is the zoom out 3D mode. One more goes to the 3D zoom in mode. And that's as far as you can go with that. But for our purposes, let's go back to the 2D normal. So we can kind of see a good part of the map, but also be able to see some good definition as well. Now, I also want to point out there's also a jump map. Now, the jump map will show you the entirety of the map, but not very much definition. So let's have a look. And there you can see. And that inside that red box there, is what we're looking at on the larger map. But this is the entirety of the map for this particular scenario. The red represents the Japanese forces and the blue represents the American forces. Now for right now we're going to go back to the 2D normal view. There we go. Now for this next component let's take a look at the individual units. Now while I'm doing this here I think it would be appropriate if I go ahead and zoom in a little bit better so that you can see the actual units. I'm going to scroll up here just for a moment so we can take a look at these Japanese units that you see here. Now you'll notice here that they are currently using symbols that are easily recognizable using today's military standards. You'll notice that the rectangle with the X in the middle represents infantry. The rectangle with HQ, well that means headquarters. The rectangle with the horizontal upside down E stands for engineers. And the rectangle with the dot in the middle is an artillery unit. So let's take a look and see if I go ahead and select the artillery unit here. You'll notice on the information box that it is the 1st Battalion of the 22nd Artillery. It has 12 guns. Currently they have 100% of their artillery complement. They have a morale of B, which means that they're pretty good. A is the best you can get. They, they haven't moved anything. They haven't been fired upon, so their fatigue is zero. So that's very good. You want to be a fatigue of zero for as long as possible. And they can move. They have movement points of 26. However, in order for them to move, they have to have their 
you know what's going to move them so they're not going to move on their own so this particular artillery here you'll notice that there's a horse or could be a mule in the upper right hand corner and so it's, this is a mule driven uh, artillery piece so once you change the travel mode to travel it's going to be traveling by horse or mule and it's going to be moving along these roads at the various different costs that each hex has. Each hex will have a varying degree of movement points expended when one move uh, when one unit moves from hex to hex. Now I want to point out too here if you look just below the artillery piece you'll see more information about the hex itself. As we talked about, it has a combat modifier of negative 15 in a village, which means that the attacking force will have a negative 15% applied to its combat. It is basically at zero elevation, so it has zero meters. The visibility from this point here is three kilometers. Supply is, well, it's got perfect supply. Now, the objective, it's in yellow here, and if captured, it's worth 100 points to the Americans, or currently it's worth 100 points to the Japanese. And, uh, and because it's in a trench, it has an additional combat modifier of negative 40. So, if you're defending, that's a good thing, because you want to be able to be in that trench there. If I toggle the unit and make them disappear, you'll notice that uh, you can see the village. And if I put the um, unit back, uh, you'll be able to see that it's surrounded by these little markings here that will represent the trenches. Uh, so you can see here, this, this artillery piece is in a good position to both defend itself and to offer supporting fire for these various infantry units that will have to repel the American invaders. If I scroll on over here, you'll see that there are some green units. Now, green is going to represent the Americans on the standard 2D maps. And the rectangle with the anchors, well, you can probably guess it here, they represent ships. So let's click on this ship right here, and you'll notice here that it's a part of a destroyer division. And you can see the black and white picture of a destroyer. If I scroll on down to this next one here, you'll notice that it is the USS Mississippi, or BB-41. And its purpose is going to be shore bombardment here. Now, I wanted to point out here, I'm going to go back to the Japanese here for a second here. Let's go to this infantry unit here. Now, you'll notice here that this is the 12th company infantry unit of the 333rd. It has 215 men. Now, if I put the cursor over this information box and I right click it you'll notice that a bunch more information here pops up you'll see a more complete version of the order of battle you'll notice that it, you know the hard uh, which is its um, defensive and or uh, offensive capabilities based upon what type of unit it is same thing with soft its assault capabilities give it a 16 any aircraft, its defense capabilities, speed is a five, and they are on foot. So there you don't get the benefit of trucks. Also, you'll see that it has a description of the terrain. So you'll notice that on the hex, on the three lower hex sides, are streams leading into or out of that particular hex. Now, when it comes to unit types, Trust me, we have only scratched the surface here because there are many, many different unit types. Uh, and these are just a few. We've got paratroopers, you've got uh, anti-tank, anti-aircraft, you've got tanks, uh, and so on and so on. There's just a great many different of unit types, all of them with a different military symbol that you will see in the middle of those. And that will help you identify them at a glance. Now, there is one more thing here I want to show you here before we end this introduction to Philippines 44. I wanted you to see here the report catalog here and pivot back to the victory conditions. Now, you'll notice here that each victory uh, is achieved based upon the number of points that you accumulate. 
Uh, for example, if the Allies take losses, they're going to re uh, the Japanese are going to receive points for it. Men, guns, vehicles, naval losses, air losses, uh, and so on. Same thing with the Japanese. And the difference between those is going to result in a victory or a defeat for whatever side you are happen to be playing. So let's just say, for example, you were playing the Americans. At this particular moment in time, as you look at this victory dialogue, you will notice that, well, the game hasn't really started yet. So you have a total points of zero. And that means you have an allied major defeat. So if the game were to end right this very moment, the Japanese would claim a major victory. Or the Americans would have to suffer a major defeat. However, for the Americans, the good thing is that, well, the game hasn't started yet. And I suspect that by the time we get to the end of turn 637, well, I can't tell you for sure that the Americans are going to win here, but I can tell you the total point won't be zero. Uh, in order to get a major victory, the Americans will need 9,000 points added to that zero. Very achievable, I might say, but it will take some considerable time. And considerable time is what you have in this particular scenario. In fact, you have 637 turns of it. Well, anyway, I just want to thank you for listening to this introduction to Philippines 44. And I hope you will buy the game, have fun with it, offer feedback, because we're always looking for customer feedback here. And, well, have a great time playing the game. I appreciate you listening.